started. I'll get the recording going here. All right, and it looks like we've got Corinne, Grayson, Jordan. Um, I think somebody else was in, maybe they got logged out. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. So as I'm doing that, a couple things that I wanted to just kind of mention for the application um, reasoning skill, I should say application, for the reasoning skills test. This test is, is a departmental test. I, and I know that freaks some students out, but the reality is, is it's not really a, a test that is trying to determine, you know, the exact content that you understand. It's more so that you can reason through some of the things that um, you have learned this semester. So I'm sharing my PowerPoint, which of course I hate the fact that when I'm in Collaborate, I can't see your chat. So I'll keep it, let me think here what I'm gonna do. <sighs> um, this is why I teach in Zoom a lot. Um, are you guys okay to unmic or do you need to chat? I'm okay to talk. <laughs> okay. What about the rest of you? I'm here. That's fine for me. Okay. Okay. I just the, my problem is the, my problem is I can't see your your chat when I'm sharing my screen. So if you can't unmute somebody, just tell me that there's a chat in there, and I will go back and forth. Sorry. I, it's anyway. Um, okay. So as we start this review again i mentioned that this exam is more you being able to reason through information what do i mean by that so there are descriptions that'll say trs simulates tsh tsh simulates thyroid hormone thyroid hormone increases metabolism so it will tell you the information and then you have to process through the problem so i like to just kind of say that at the beginning it's not a test that's trying to determine the facts that you know it's more can you work through some of the problems given the information that you've been working with all semester so the first thing that i want to do is let's take just a minute to practice with graph interpretation so ignore the fact that gas mileage is spelled wrong in this um, but i want you to grab a little piece of scrap paper or something that you can jot things down on and I'm going to give you four different scenarios. And I don't want you to say anything out loud, but I want you to choose from these four graphs when I give you a description. So just write down on your piece of paper, you know, one through four. And then when I describe the scenarios, I want you to say that would be graph A, B, C, or D on your paper. Don't say it out loud. So the first one I want to go through is which one of these four graphs, and again, write it on your paper, is showing a correlation with the speed, but not with the tire pressure. So I want you to write down A, B, C, or D on your paper, which one of these four graphs shows a correlation with speed, but not with tire pressure on gas mileage. So speed and gas mileage correlate, but not tire pressure. The second one, I want you to write down which of these four graphs is describing or which of these four graphs does not show a correlation with either the speed nor the tire pressure. So no correlation with speed on gas mileage, no correlation with tire pressure on gas mileage. Which one for number three, which one shows a correlation with both the speed and the tire pressure. Which of these four graphs shows a correlation with speed and gas mileage and tire pressure and gas mileage? And then the last one, which of the graphs shows a correlation with tire pressure and gas mileage, but not with speed? Anybody want me to repeat any of the one through four before we go over them? Okay. So for the first one, I said, which of them shows a correlation with speed and not tire pressure? Who wants to venture their answer for me? What did you put for the first one? answer. <laughs> it's A. 
<laughs> Thank you. It's A. That is correct. So remember, the reason that A is correct is because we see a slope for the speed and gas mileage, right? So if I get my little pen in here, we know that this is X, right? And this is Y. So in this case, I am looking for a slope. When we're looking for X and Y, the first thing you're always going to look for is, is there a slope? It could be a negative slope. It could be a positive slope. But in this case, we see a negative slope. Then we know X and Y have a correlation. Tire pressure is not correlating. And how do you know that? How do I know that tire pressure did not correlate with Y? Because all the lines run basically together. Exactly. Whenever you have crossing lines, that means that tire pressure is not showing a correlation. So when we talk about the additional parameters, so I'm not going to write this whole word, but additional parameters would be things like this. Then you are looking, when there's a correlation, for lines that are separate. So in this case, they are crossing, so that's how we came to the conclusion that there was not a correlation. Now, we could have three lines in this case, we could have 10 lines, we can have two lines, just depends on how many parameters are given to us in this text box. So the second scenario I said, okay, which one of these graphs did not show a correlation with either the speed or the tire pressure? Anybody else wanna volunteer their answer for number two? What'd you put for um, number I two? Said, I said, oh, sorry. Say it again. <laughs> I just, you cut out, say it one more time. Oh, I said C. For C, two. and that's right, exactly. So with C, do we have a slope? Nope, so, so speed is not correlating. Do we have separate lines? Nope, so tire pressure is not correlating either. So that is correct. So the answer for number three is B, as in boy, but I want you to tell me, what is B telling me? I know B is the correct answer, but what am I seeing for this graph down here? What is showing a correlation? Is it showing a correlation for like um, speed and tire pressure and like everything kind of? Exactly. You got it. It's got a correlation with both. So, yep, there's a slope. Speed and gas mileage have a correlation. My lines are all separate, so tire pressure is also showing a correlation. So the correct answer was B, but I wanted you to think about you know, if you didn't write down what my question was, understanding why that's the right answer. What about D? D is the answer for the last one. What do we see for D? How can we interpret D? What do we see in here? Is there a correlation between speed and gas mileage? Is there a slope? Nope. There's only a so, correlation between tire pressure because they're separate lines, but there is no slope. You got it. You got it. So what I tell everybody is I know it seems like an oversimplification, but reading a graph is a visual thing. So when you look at the graph, no matter what is on X and Y, if there's a slope, they're correlated. Now, it may not be a perfect slope. It might kind of look like something like this, right, where it might be a wavy line, but the general trend is up. Or on the way down, maybe it looks something like this, but it's a general trend down. If there is a slope, no matter what is on the X, it's going to correlate. Again, when we're looking at this text box, which is what you're seeing here, if these lines are separate, whatever you have here, so for example, on one of my lab quizzes, I had a graph that I developed that was talking about um, type of study method and on my y-axis was exam score. So if the type of study method correlated with the exam score, then I should see a separate line for all seven of those different methods. So again, it doesn't matter what terms are here, it's literally a visible thing that you're looking at. Take it X and Y first, then go to your text box, and then look at your answer choices from that point. Any questions about this? Is this clear? Does everyone feel comfortable about graph interpretation? There are 12 points just on graph reading. We good? I have a quick question. Yep. If the slope, you drew the wavy line, if it goes up, 
and then at some point it comes straight back down, there's still a correlation. It's just that maybe it would be increasing than decreasing or, you know, something like that. If there was one, like one data point that went up and then it continued in the same direction, I would consider it to still be a slope, a consistent slope. If you ended up with something that looks like this. Yeah, that's what I meant. You know, in this case, because it's so up and down, I would say there's no slope because it went up, it went down, it went up, and then it ended up down here, right, kind of at the bottom. Oops, this is an arrow. So if it went something like this, but kept going up, then yes. But in this case, it's really, if you kind of average it out, right, it would kind of look like a horizontal line. And don't worry about it. You're, you're not going to get something that's going to be that complicated. It's either going to be trending up or trending down. Okay, thank you. Okay. Does that help? I mean, and, and not to say that just for the purpose of the test, but but in this case, you know, I, I, I we wouldn't give you something like this because you truly would need to average it out to know if it was a flat line or if it was generally trending up or down. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. All right, anybody else for graph reading? The only other thing that I'll mention here that sometimes students forget to think about is the interpretation of a graph. So yes, you can say whether or not there's a correlation. What you also need to then say is, okay, when would I use this information if I were to, to apply it to something in a future study? So if you remember, there was the lab that you did that was talking about cerebral palsy and the EMG, the electrical activity, and it said, okay, which of these would be useful to study again, right? And we only picked the ones to use in our future study that were showing a correlation. So just remember maybe to review that lab a little bit and think about, okay, can I interpret the graph? And would I know basically how I would use that information to apply to a future study is the only other thing there. Okay. All right. Moving on. The next couple topics look at diffusion osmosis and osmolarity and tonicity. So this is going way back, going all the way back to the beginning of the semester. And just simply remembering when we're talking about diffusion, you're always talking about the movement of a solute. So something is going from high to low. Um, if we have a greater concentration on one side, it's going to move to the side where there's less solute in the effort to reach equilibrium. We use the term osmosis for when we are talking about solutes that cannot move, so the water has to move instead to equal out the two sides. So the big thing here is just remembering if you're referenced or asking anything about diffusion or osmosis, you have to remember, okay, what's moving? Is the solute moving? Then it's diffusion. If it's the osmosis, then you know the solute is unpenetrating, so the water has to move instead. You won't have to necessarily calculate osmolarity. That's not a big um, objective of this test. But you do need to understand the difference between osmolarity and tonicity. So osmolarity, always go back, and we talked about this recently when we did the fluid and electrolyte lab. Osmolarity is that total solute concentration in a solution. So we talked about, you know, 0.3 osmoles or 300 milliosmoles is that concentration of the, the plasma of your blood, right? A typical human cell. If we then talk about tonicity, we are then applying a solution and comparing that osmolarity to that of a human cell or the human blood. So remember, isotonic means it has the same osmolarity. Hypotonic means it has a lower osmolarity, so less than 0.3 osmoles, or, or excuse me, 300 milliosmoles. Hypertonic, then, higher than 0.3 or 300 milli. The other piece of that is simply, again, remembering what will that do to the movement of water. In an isotonic solution, there's no net gain of water inside the cell or leaving the cell. If we have a hypotonic, then we know the water is going to enter into the cell because of the concentration difference and trying to equal out between so the water would go in and cause the cell to lyse. Hypertonic solutions are going to draw the water out of the cell and cause it to shrink or crenate. So a lot of this will be applying these terms to different scenarios. What happens if you have this? Or what happens if you have that? What will the water do? Where will the solute move? And things like that. So any questions at all about osmolarity? Tonicity, diffusion, osmosis, anything on this screen? Okay. 
The next thing that we look at are consensual reflexes. So the definition here, does anybody remember a what stimulus produces a what response? Consensual reflexes. We talked about pupillary and we talked about corneal. It's a unilateral stimulus produces a bilateral response. Okay, thank you, sorry. I'm torturing you to talk today, I know. Uh, a unilateral stimulus produces a bilateral, I'll abbreviate, response. So one eye receives the light, both eyes will constrict. So remember, if we're talking about, and I'm just going to do this so we kind of are on the same track here for the left and the right eye. If I shine the light into the left eye, I know the cranial two is going to take that to the brain. And then the response will be both eyes will constrict. I would come over here to the right eye. When I shine the light into the right eye, it'll get to the brain. And again, both eyes will constrict, right? That would be my normal pupillary response. So if you're working through these scenarios, let me go back here for a second. If you're working through these scenarios, again, you have to test both eyes. I just described the normal response to you, but you'll be given abnormal responses. Let's say I shine the light into the left eye and only the right eye constricts. I shine the light into the right eye and again, only the right eye constricted. Well, that's not a normal response, but we need to figure out what is working and what's not working. Well, in both cases, I got the right eye to respond, and I had a response in both eyes. So I know that two took it to the brain on both sides, so both of these are working fine because I got a response both times in the right eye. I know that cranial three is working okay because that's what's needed to cause the constriction in that right eye. So in both cases, my cranial three was not allowing the constriction, so I would deduct that in that case, that scenario, that there was a lesion or something wrong with cranial three on the left side. If I do another example, let's talk about the scenario where I now, I'm gonna do a different color, sorry. I shine the light, and again, here we are left and right, I shine the light into the left eye and both eyes constrict. I shine the light into the right eye and I get no response. I'll say it one more time. I shine the light in the left eye, both eyes constricted. I shine the light into the right eye and I got no response. Well, I know that when I was on the left side that it had to get to the brain, so two is working fine because I got a response in both eyes. If I get a response in both eyes, that tells me that cranial three is working on both sides. So what would I say is my problem then for this example? What, where's my lesion or my deficit? Would you say um, CN number two because it just didn't work in the right eye? Correct, so right here, is my problem, cranial nerve two, on the right side because it never got to the brain, that's why I didn't see a response happen at all on that right side. So with these consensual reflexes, remember, you have to figure out what's working, what's not working. I know this, again, is an oversimplification, but now that you've learned it, if you think about it logically, if you test both eyes and you get a response, but it's not the normal response, then you know two is taking that signal to the brain. It has to be three on the side that's not responding. If you test both eyes and one side does nothing, the other side works fine, you know it has to be cranial two because you got the normal response and you on the one side and then you got no response on the other. So I know that's kind of a simplification, but now that you've studied this enough, it kind of makes logical sense. You also have both the pupillary, which you see on the screen, and then you also have the other consensual reflex, which is the corneal reflex. It works exactly the same, but you're using cranial nerve 5 and cranial nerve 7 
instead of two and three. But it works exactly the same. I touch the cornea of the right eye, seven causes both eyes to blink. I touch the cornea of the other eye, five picks up the sensory, seven causes both eyes to blink. So two and five are the sensory, seven and three are the motor, if you think of it that way. But definitely make sure that you're going back and you are reviewing both the pupillary and the corneal reflexes that we studied in the lab manual and we also studied in lecture. There's also some good um, visuals, some animations in the ebook on iBook as well. Okay, any questions on this before I move on? All right, moving along. So the next topic we're gonna to talk about is synaptic transmission. And so what I wanna emphasize here is you have four basic categories that we studied with synapse and synaptic um, enzymes, not synaptic enzymes, synaptic neurotransmitters, excuse me. You don't have to memorize what dopamine, acetylcholine, all the different neurotransmitters that we talked about, what they do. That's not the purpose of this section. But what you do need to understand is why you would give somebody an agonist, why you would give them an antagonist, et cetera. So we're gonna talk about the function and the general understanding of what these four categories do. The first one is an agonist. So an agonist does the same thing as a neurotransmitter. It mimics it. So whatever word I put in front of it as far as neurotransmitter, a dopamine agonist does the same thing as dopamine. An acetylcholine agonist does the same thing as acetylcholine. So just remember that somebody that's going to receive an agonist, we want them to have more of that neurotransmitter effect. So would you give this to somebody that has too little or too much of a neurotransmitter? Why would I give somebody an agonist for any neurotransmitter? If they have too little or they have too much of a neurotransmitter? I would give it to somebody that has too little, right? Because it's gonna do the same thing as that neurotransmitter, so I'm going to need more of it. That's why you would give somebody a dopamine agonist. They don't have enough dopamine, so I give them the dopamine agonist, and it will help them to have more enhanced effects of what dopamine naturally does. So if I think about the second one, an antagonist, again, does the opposite. It blocks that neurotransmitter, so it prevents that neurotransmitter from doing what it naturally wants to do. So you would give somebody an antagonist if they have too much of a neurotransmitter, right? If I have too much acetylcholine, giving them an antagonist would decrease that high level of acetylcholine and bring it back down. I think I talked about this in my recitations this semester, but I talk in my classes a lot about too much of something is not always a good thing. Too much of a neurotransmitter is not good. It's gonna overstimulate that postsynaptic cell. So we do give patients antagonists to drop the level and decrease that effect that that neurotransmitter has because it's in high amounts. So again, an antagonist would be given to somebody that has too much of a neurotransmitter. Reuptake inhibitors simply prevent the reuptake. Well, what is reuptake before we talk about the inhibitor? Reuptake is kind of the quote unquote recycling of a neurotransmitter. It's where I'm putting it back into the presynaptic, right? This is my presynaptic cell up here. I'm sorry, up here. Um, putting it back where it just came from. So here's my neurotransmitter you're seeing down in the synapse here, and I'm pumping it back to where it just came from. If I prevent the reuptake, I'm not gonna recycle it, and it's gonna end up staying in that synapse longer. So reuptake inhibitors will lead to an increase, a buildup of that neurotransmitter in that synaptic cleft or that space. The last one is synaptic enzyme inhibitors. And again, when we talk about enzymes, before I talk about inhibitors, enzymes break down the neurotransmitter. Once I release acetylcholine, acetylcholine esterase, ACE, 
right enzyme at the end, ASC at the end, breaks it down so that it doesn't build up in the cleft. That's a normal process. If I inhibit those enzymes, I don't destroy the neurotransmitter, so it stays in that synaptic cleft or space longer. So hopefully it makes sense if I talk about a reuptake inhibitor and an enzyme inhibitor, they really have the same net effect. They're just doing it by two different mechanisms. Reuptake inhibitors prevent it from being taken back and recycled. Synaptic enzyme inhibitors just prevent it from getting broken down. For our purposes in this class, you could select either one of those as helping to basically increase the level of neurotransmitter because you would use both of these if somebody didn't have enough, right? They don't have enough, I prevent the breakdown, I get more. They don't have enough, I prevent the recycling, and now I get more. So when you get to pharmacology and further classes with neurotransmitters, you'll understand we have to have these two categories because not every neurotransmitter gets taken back up by reuptake. Not every neurotransmitter has an enzyme that breaks it down. So it gets a little more detailed as you progress, but for our purposes, understanding the net effect is what we're looking at. So to recap before I move on, there are three of them that can be given if somebody does not have enough. Enzyme inhibitors, reuptake inhibitors, and agonists. There's one that can be given if somebody has too much, and that was the antagonist. What if somebody doesn't produce a neurotransmitter at all? What's the only one that I can potentially use for them? An agonist. An agonist, right? Because blocking it's not going to do any, it's breakdown, or blocking it's reuptake isn't going to help if they don't produce it at all. So exactly, an agonist in that case would be my only option. Questions at all about synaptic transmission before I continue on? Okay. Romberg test. This is something you studied in the application problems. This is, oh, and going back, you did study the um, synaptic transmission with application problems. So if you want to go back and review some of those, it might be helpful for you looking at how you can apply some of these things. Cerebellum, um, sensory information, the Romberg test is another topic that you covered in the application problems. It was covered in the book and in um, the back of the manual in the motor control section. Remembering that the cerebellum is integrating the sensory information. So we are looking at vision, proprioception, and vestibular sensory information that goes to the cerebellum so it can smooth out and coordinate the motor movements so they appear very smooth. I'm going back to this example because I think it's such a powerful one in the sense that when you think about the cerebellum, I, the analogy in your book is like driving a car. If you drive and you know you're on a straight stretch of highway, when somebody's watching you drive down that straight stretch of highway, it appears you're not doing anything in that car. You're just sitting there driving like this. But you know as a driver that you are constantly doing this even though you're driving down a straight stretch of highway because you are making fine-tuned modifications so from the outside that, a car, that car appears to be driving very smoothly with, with little effort inside you're making all the modifications that's what your cerebellum is doing with the sensory information the visual information the proprioception knowing exactly where my feet are on the floor right now without look at them if someone were lifting up my fingers my toes i could tell you it's my right big toe or my left pinky finger because we know kind of that where our body is in space. Why do you touch your finger to your nose when they're doing a sobriety test? I can't see my nose, but I know where it's at because of that proprioception. And then vestibular, you learned for your inner ear, your vestibular apparatus, detecting the movement of your head and your body position in terms of the overall movement, vestibular sensation. The cerebellum can do this with just two out of the three. So if you're standing and you put your feet, if you stand, put your feet together with your eyes open, you need to be able to maintain balance with your eyes open. If you can't even do that, then you don't have two out of the three. You can't continue the Romberg test because the cerebellum itself most likely is not working at that point. If you stand with your feet together, you can do it. May not be easy, but you can do it. You shut your eyes and you sway, 
that's a positive Romberg test. Well, that means that we don't have the two out of the three that we need. We took away vision, and we should still have proprioception and vestibular. If we sway and have that positive test, it has to be one of those two that's not working. And that's where you need a little bit more information. Can they identify the position of their body in space? Then it must be vestibular. If they can't identify the position of their body in space, then it most likely is proprioception. Sometimes they'll talk about symptoms. They, they close their eyes and the whole room just feels like it's spinning around or they're rocking like they're on a boat or something. So those types of scenarios would indicate it's more of a vestibular, not identifying the position. They can't touch their finger to their nose. They can't tell when somebody's lifting up their fingers or toes, et cetera. Those would be examples of testing for proprioception. Any questions on that at all? There's some great information in the back of the lab, lab manual. You have the um, application section, I believe was wrong for test. Okay. Then we get into a lot of the homeostatic relationships and cause and effect sequences. So when we look at understanding and being able to work through blood pressure, we are really looking at all of these parameters here. We talk about cardiac output, we talk about resistance, and we talk about blood volume. These two were the cardiovascular ones that we studied in the cardiovascular homeostasis lab. And then this one was the one you studied recently where we were looking at blood volume. I tend to abbreviate that so you might see it as BV, where we were talking about the manipulation of ADH, renin, and, and aldosterone. So when you're thinking about blood pressure, I sometimes will write it out so it looks kind of like this. You have heart rate. It's supposed to be H times, oh no, hold on one second, sorry about that. Um, put here, here we go. You have cardiac output times resistance times blood volume, if you want to look at it like this. And then I tell my students, if you write this out on a piece of paper, then just remember all the parameters that go into this. So cardiac output is the heart rate times the stroke volume. So let's say maybe they tell you heart rate goes up or heart rate goes down. You have to know that that's part of cardiac output. Resistance, we're talking about vasodilation, vasoconstriction, right? Increasing the diameter of the lumen, decreasing the diameter will raise and lower the resistance. And then blood volume is primarily influenced by the ADH and the aldosterone. Anytime you are manipulating cardiac output, resistance, or blood volume, I immediately want you to think of what is that going to do to blood pressure? And because we have this equation, we know that there's a direct correlation. If I tell you that cardiac output has gone down, I know that that's going to drop the blood pressure, right? Because they are directly correlated. Okay, well, then the body is going to have to respond to do something to bring the blood pressure up. Does anybody want to tell me two things that we can do to raise the blood pressure if we had a drop due to cardiac output going down? We I can increase resistance, okay. resistance, increase resistance and increase um, stroke volume or blood volume. So close. You're, you're right on the volume. So increase the blood volume, right? So in this case, the only reason I'm not going to go to stroke volume is because cardiac output is causing my issue. So I would want to go to anything else to try to fix it. That would be blood volume going up and resistance going up. Does that make sense? If stroke volume is correlated with cardiac output and that's what made my blood pressure go down, I have to look to the other parameters to try to help it to bring it up. Yeah. Does that, that make sense. sense? Okay, perfect. So whatever I, I tell students is whatever's the origin of the disturbance, it's so natural to say, well, if you raise the cardiac output, it's going to fix the blood pressure. And that's absolutely right. But if that's the origin of my disturbance, I have to look to everything else to bring it up. Now, you know that this is the correct cause and effect sequence, but what I need you to remember is maybe the answer choices say increase renin or vasodilate or vasoconstrict, right? So you have to know that vasoconstriction will raise resistance. You have to know that renin 
will increase the blood volume. And it tells you in these little scenarios, like it'll say a little bit of a relationship there, but that's why it's so important that you're going through all of these details and remembering what does it mean to raise resistance? What factors go into cardiac output? How can I manipulate the blood volume? And then you have everything that you need. I will say, when it comes to these homeostatic relationships and endocrine feedback that we'll talk about in a minute, you need to have a scrap piece of paper in front of you, write out these cause and effect sequences. And then you read the question, you write out your answer, and then you look at the answer choices to figure out what matches with what you just wrote out on your paper. Because nine times out of 10, students know these relationships, but when you look at the answer choices without writing out your cause and effect, you can kind of talk yourself into all the different choices. So write it out, then look at what you had to pick from from answer choices, and then match the one that matches what you wrote on your paper. So blood pressure, cardiac output, resistance, and blood volume. Cardiac output and resistance are cardiovascular. We know that the blood volume is the renal way of manipulating and ultimately regulating the blood pressure. The other homeostatic cause and effect that we look at is with blood gas pH disturbances. We know that we have the conditions that are considered respiratory in origin, and then we have the conditions that are considered to be metabolic in origin. If I'm talking about respiratory acidosis, there's two things that I know right off the bat. I know that CO2 is the origin of my disturbance or the change in respiratory rate because it's a respiratory condition. I know that I have a pH that is low or going down or low, lower than it should be because of the word acidosis. So if I look at respiratory acidosis, respiratory rate is going to go down when somebody has a respiratory acidosis, meaning I'm building up the levels of carbon dioxide, which we know gives us more hydrogen ions, which I know is going to lower my pH. Remember that when I look at oxygen, I usually focus more on the CO2 because we know that's the influence with the pH. If I slow down my respiratory rate, remember that means I'm going to get less oxygen. That one's probably the most intuitive for students. Does anybody want to help me with respiratory alkalosis? What's my respiratory rate going to do? In respiratory alkalosis, I know that my rate has gone My up. rate's gone up, good, which means I do what to my levels of CO2? They go down. They go down. They go down because I'm breathing so frequently. I'm losing CO2. I'm losing hydrogen, which is going to make my pH go up. And if I'm breathing faster, I will have an increase in the oxygen. So when you are working through a respiratory condition, I want to emphasize you always start with change in respiratory rate. What does that do to CO2? How does that affect the pH? So that is consistent, you can see, with both of them. You always start with the rate. What does that do to CO2? And then how does that change the pH? If I'm working through a disturbance that is metabolic in origin, Remember that now we are talking about a change in pH first. So in this case, if I have a metabolic acidosis, my pH is going to start off what? It's going to start out low, right? Because a low pH means acidosis. Low pH is going to then cause the respiratory compensation to kick in and increase my breathing in an effort to lower the carbon dioxide. And we know when I lower carbon dioxide, I lower hydrogen. When I talk about an increase in respiratory rate, again, I will see that increase in oxygen here. So when I have alkalosis, I start with a high pH. That means I'm going to lower my respiratory rate, build up my carbon dioxide and hydrogen, and I know that if I decrease my rate, I decrease my oxygen. Remember that we have the Rome, R-O-M-E. Rome is a mnemonic that we can use 
to look at the pH and the CO2. If it's respiratory, my CO2 and my pH should be opposite, and they are in both scenarios. That's my double check. When it's metabolic, I know that my CO2 and my pH should be in the same direction, and when I look at pH and CO2, they are going in the same direction. So remember, Rome is a way for you to do a self-check, not necessarily to memorize, but a good way to go back and then same thing, draw out your scenarios, then go back and figure out what are the answer choices that, that I have been given. And again, remember that when we're talking about a metabolic condition, we always start with a change in pH, then the respiratory kicks in as a compensation and manipulates the CO2. So the order that I have on here is significant because that's the order in which these processes are going to happen. Endocrine, you work through the scenarios for feedback. One of the things here again is you're given these scenarios and what you need to do is simply figure out what would happen with the manipulation that they give you. So draw out your endocrine feedback loops. If you need to draw the little arrows on your piece of paper so they're all in front of you, then you start with whatever they give you. They said somebody didn't have a thyroid gland, what would you expect to happen? Well, if they don't have a thyroid gland, then I know TH is gonna be low. This is where I'm starting, and then I simply would fill in the blanks. If this is low, can anybody tell me what's that, what is that gonna do to the TRH and the TSH? Is there going to be any feedback if there's not enough thyroid hormone? They would both be high, exactly. So in this case, you started here, and then you filled in your blanks. Don't keep looping through where you can get an answer that matches every answer choice. Go with what you're given. Cortisol works the same way. We just have the different hormones. What if I were to tell you that somebody had an injection of ACTH? somebody received an injection of ACTH, what would be expected to happen as a result? Where would I now start? You start with ACTH, start with ACTH. the cortisol would go up, and then the So if I start with ACTH, you're right, ACTH would be what, just so I fill that in? Oh, you're giving an injection, so ACTH goes up. Correct, good, yep, and that's gonna make cortisol go? Up. Exactly. And then if cortisol is high, what is that going to do to CRH? It's going to lower it even more. Exactly. So the big thing here, again, is writing out your flow charts. Where do I start? Then that's the information I'm given. And then how do I fill in the blanks from there? If you start in the middle, then you have to work your way down before you work your way up. In this case, I started at the bottom. So then I went back and I did the other two. The easiest scenario, scenario, excuse me, is that if I start with TRH. If I say somebody has a hypothalamus that doesn't produce TRH, well, that's the easiest of them all because then they all are going to go down, right? If we start at the top, we work our way down. If we start in the middle, we work our way down and then back up. They will tell you all of these hormones. You just have to process through the different scenarios that they give you. What happens if I give an injection of this? What happens if they don't make this? And then just process through what would happen with each of them as a result. So that is basically the main content that I have um, included on the reasoning skills test. If I go back for just a minute to the slides that you have posted from Dr. Mogg, I do encourage you, the handout has this. Basically, you'll see the same things that I just talked about. He does give some great tips for strategy here. You know, remember, you have these skills, right? You've done this. I love the Rocky picture, the skills you already have test. It's just a matter of applying what you know. So read the question, write out your cause and effect scenario, look and see what matches and then maybe go back and reread the question one more time before you select your answer but most students you know you could really have this as a short answer test because a lot of this you've worked through so many times 
that you know you you process through these. So there are a couple of scenarios in here that may look slightly different than I had as I'm scrolling through it quickly as I know we're running out of time. But there are um, you know the same types of concepts that I discussed with you. Maybe some other examples that you can go through in both the lab manual and what you have in the um, recitation site. Remember, there are practice questions in the manual as well. So you want to go back and you can see, I think he actually has the same graphs that I used. Um, in the back of your lab manual, they're not written like multiple choice questions for all of them, but I will put your mind at ease that yes, for this class or for this test, they are all multiple choice questions. You don't have any um, short answer. They're all, there's 35 questions. They are worth two points each for the total of 70 points. So I'm just kind of scrolling through this so you know what is also available for you in Blackboard on the recitation site as well. So I did have a couple students that joined us, I think, after we got started. Sorry, I was sharing my screen and couldn't see everybody. Are there specific questions or anything that you want me to review that I did not already go through with you? Was that helpful? Do you feel more confident? The thermoregulatory, yeah, so that's a great question, Corinne. So with thermoregulatory, it literally will talk about the vasodilation, vasoconstriction. So I think there's maybe one question, maybe two, I think there's only one on thermoregulation. So the key with that is in warmer, conditions or when the body needs to basically get rid of heat because the temperature is starting to rise you will vasodilate to lose that heat to the environment when you're in cooler temperatures or you want to keep that warmth that heat in the body you will have vasoconstriction so it's a very short little section with thermoregulation mostly looking at that vasodilation vasoconstriction the only other thing that it's probably pretty logical to everybody is um, sweating or um, shivering right so if the body's cold it can shiver to generate heat to keep you warm if you're warm you can increase the sweat perspiration to lose that heat by evaporation um, I will say that the, I think the most challenging ones are the endocrine feedback for students and probably blood pressure and osmolarity. Those are the ones that I think students struggle with the most. Not because they're the hardest, but again, I think for endocrine, you want to look at it and answer it without really writing out that flow chart. And students that I've had, you know, particularly when we were in person and, and I, you know, they would take the test and I would say, hey, you know, how did you do so well? What, what did you do to prepare? A lot of them, you know, said just practicing writing out those cause and effect sequences. So I know for recitation and for my students, you know, they're so sick of me talking about those daggone cause and effect sequences. Hold on a second. Hey, I think the garage door is open. It wouldn't shut. Sorry. As it's pouring down rain. Um, so when I, you know, watch them, for example, taking the test, write things down. I know that you guys have to take them now on a computer, but that doesn't mean that you can't have that piece of paper there drawing out your flow charts and doing those things um, that will, again, that tactile learning sometimes just helps it come back into your memory. Like, oh, that's right. I'm doing a respiratory condition or I'm doing a metabolic condition. Those cause and effect can really help. So um, the only other thing that I will say that I didn't talk about, um, yeah, give me one second. The only other thing is osmolarity students struggle with. What am I fixing? Am I fixing the osmolarity of the blood or am I fixing the osmolarity of the, the fluid, right, the filtrate? So you focused most of your discussions on fixing the osmolarity of the blood. That's when we were either increasing os uh, or increasing ADH or increasing aldosterone. If you are trying to fix the osmolarity of the filtrates, right, what you're putting into the filtrate, getting rid of in, out of the body in the urine, everything is opposite. So if aldosterone goes down, you put more sodium in the filtrate. If aldosterone goes up, 
you put more sodium in the blood, less in the filtrate. So that's one thing that students historically will struggle a little bit as well. Um, I will go back, Grayson, I think you asked about page 15 on the Rocky handout. Okay, so I'm going to go and I can do this one question and then I have a 12 o'clock meeting that I have to be in. So I'll do this one thing and then I do apologize, I'll have to go. But maybe one of the other recitations you can attend this week, they can go over it a little bit um, more as well. So page 15 of the Rocky one. So is this, is this the correct one, Grayson? I'm hoping, okay. So consider the relationships with electrolyte homeostasis. Okay. Increased osmolarity, so this is again giving you the relationship, how you might see it written. Increased osmolarity stimulates ADH secretion and inhibits aldosterone. ADH will cause the water retention, which will lower the osmolarity. Aldosterone causes the sodium to be retained. Potassium is opposite, right? If we keep sodium, we get rid of potassium. That will raise the osmolarity. And if somebody has a low blood pressure, they both go up. So the question says, how will ADH, aldosterone, urine sodium, blood potassium change if somebody has a meal with excess sodium. So the first thing that we need to determine there, based on what they've given, the only thing that they've told us is somebody has a lot of sodium. They took in a meal with a lot of sodium. So that means the osmolarity of their blood is going to go up. If I have a high osmolarity of my blood, what do I need? Do I need more solute or do I need more water? If I have a lot of sodium in my blood, water. I need water. Water. Right? Good. Yeah. Which hormone is going to give me water in my blood, making me keep and retain the water? It tells me right up here that ADH is what I need. So my ADH levels are going to go up to answer this first one. If I have a lot of sodium in my blood, do I need aldosterone? Do I want aldosterone to go up if I have a lot of sodium in my blood? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yep, so aldosterone would go down. So aldosterone would go down, meaning if aldosterone goes down, my sodium is now going to go into what? It's going to go down in the blood, and it's going to go up in the urine. Okay? If I'm getting rid of sodium and putting it in my urine, then what's going to happen to my potassium? Potassium is going to go the opposite, and potassium is going to go up in my blood. Because remember, if you dump sodium in the urine, potassium is going to come in the blood because they have that inverse relationship. So does that make sense, Grayson? ADH would go up, aldosterone would go down, urine sodium is gonna go up because I'm kicking all the sodium out. If I kick the sodium out, blood potassium levels will go up. Does that help? Okay, you're very welcome, very welcome. All right, I have time for maybe one more quick question. Anybody else have anything else that they wanted to ask before we sign off? All right. I felt like I really talked fast through all of that, but I hope that helped. Um, I have confidence in all of you. I know most of you have been coming to recitation all semester, and I'm sure that that's going to come um, play out and, and, and basically help you. Um, when you get to that reasoning skills test, but I've enjoyed having you all in recitation. I know you usually get me as I'm running in from my workout, um, but I hope that you really all found the recitations helpful. We started this about two years ago now, year and a half, two years ago, and I do feel that it's nice just sometimes to even have a different instructor or just have time to really dive into some of the difficult concepts that we cover. So. 
I'm going to stop the recording.